So this is the dingo dog launch and the floaty thing here. Always sharks. There's water, there's sharks. Uh oh. Look at that. That's like a bona fide boat guy knot on that ship there. Hey, you know, you're not a Vietnamese guy in a sand pan. Just row like a normal person. I like that part the best. Do you still gotta row your way out though? It takes nothing to row out the first time. Right. All right. So that's just fiberglass, is it? No, no, not even. Not even. Not even. Just solid cedar. One by fencing boards for the sides yeah quarter inch uh, factory fur for the top and bottom yeah and then uh, insides are just more cedar fence boards I for see. Yeah, yeah. frames going across all right Both <coughs> exciting stuff hi i'm mark and welcome back to nomad boat building and welcome to our little design on the fly workshop so while i do design boats, I don't really consider myself a boat designer. It's something I do more out of necessity, although I do enjoy the process, and I don't really get into the heavy number crunching of it. You know, I'll do some very, very basic rough calculations, but uh, I don't really get into the real nitty and gritty that uh, a lot of yacht designers would get into. Got a little piece of property on a lake, on an island. It's a great little lake that is really nice for swimming, but the only place you can swim is right in the middle because everywhere near the shore is super weedy. And I needed a way to get from the shore to the swimming spot. The solution I came up with was a scow. I call a swimming scow. Dead flat on the top, just a slight camber to the bottom, and I've cambered the sides just a little bit for looks. Here I've got a smaller scale model of it. This is a one inch to the foot scale model. And I built this model as part of a reimagining of this design, but we're gonna back up a little bit. So I've already built this boat. I built it with my daughters uh, in their first week out of school, the summer that we got that cottage. The cottage was a complete disaster, needed totally rebuilding. So I didn't wanna spend a lot of time and money building this boat to make use of it. I just wanted to be able to get into the water very, very quickly and very cheaply because there's a pile of money was gonna go into the cottage itself. So the prototype of this was built out of your typical building supply materials. We knocked it out inside of a week. I think it was about five days start to finish in total. My daughters did most of the construction themselves with of course my assistants, but I let them do a lot of the work. They kind of bailed on me near the end where I took care of some fiddly stuff, but for the most part, they did all the construction. We made the sides out of fencing grade cedar. We made bulkheads out of fencing grade cedar. And then we decked it top and bottom with exterior grade plywood, quarter inch fur. So this boat is pretty straightforward. It is essentially a box. And it's a box that we've tapered some portions of in order to make it look a little bit better and also to make it move through the water a little bit better because while this doesn't need to really move through the water for its purposes, we do need to get it from shore to about 50 feet out. And if it were a full on straight box, that would be a pretty laborious activity to try and shove it out there and then bring it back again. The ends of that box would dig into the water, prevent forward motion. Now the first version of this, I didn't build as well as I would have liked to. I put the bulkheads too far apart and as a result, the deck's a little bit soft and spongy in spots. It's fine for me, but when I get heavier friends that get on the boat, you can feel the thing groaning just a little bit under their weight. So what I want to do today is just redesign that exact same boat and try and come up with some efficiencies to make it a slightly better build than the first one was. I chose the size because I wanted something that was gonna be roomy enough to for the family to get onto and yet still be economical in materials. And I, in particular, I wanted to be able to get it to and from the water and I wanted the kids to be able to wrestle it down to the water. Now, of course, it ended up 
heavier than I intended it to, but uh, I don't mind the weight because once you're using it, the weight keeps it from being too jittery. So if you take the volume of what this boat would be if it were just a box, the displacement for such a box to basically sink it into the lake water would take about 1,760 pounds. Uh, by cutting a wedge out of the bottom of it, both ends, I lose some displacement, but not as much as you might think. I actually lose about 330 pounds all in. And by shaving it down on the ends down here to give it shape on the deck, I only lose about 30 pounds on each end. So that adds a little bit of complication to the build, shaving these things down, but it makes the boat look a whole lot more interesting. So this is one version of the redesign that I wanted to do. This was sort of an idea about a plywood version. When I started to think about how I would convert this design to plywood, entirely plywood, uh, things got complicated really quickly. And I started to get away from the thing that I think was kind of really fun about this boat, this design, was the fact that it's super, super simple conceptually and simple to build and relatively economical on materials. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build that boat right now. We're gonna do it at scale. We're gonna do it at the same scale as this drawing. This is um, 1 8 scale or uh, 1 8 of an inch equals one inch one and a half inches to the foot. It's a nice scale for doing models. It's a little bigger than I need it to be for the complexity of this design. However, when you build smaller, like this one inch scale here, um, while this is perfectly fine, it gets really fiddly and there's little aspects of the, of the construction that you just can't really pull off exactly. And so the reason I like to build these models at scale is because it gives me a walkthrough of the process. I have to think about what the process of building the real boat will be, and that helps me make design decisions. Now, if I wanted to build like, you know, your basic half model style model of this boat, uh, I could certainly do that, but it's pretty useless. At its most basic level, we're just talking about this would be the model with, of course, the both ends shaved down a little bit, and I could certainly do that, but not really useful for what we're going to do. So this is just our basic drawing and I can make little notes on here as I proceed to try and flesh out exactly what I think this boat is going to be when it's done. Take a bit of cedar scrap and I've just cut it all down to what represents dimensional lumber at this scale. So these are one by eights by 12 feet long. Uh, these represent half sheets of plywood and I'm not going to plank the whole boat with the plywood. I'm just going to do half of the boat, just like I did with that other little model. And that's because I want the interior of this model to be exposed for reference. Imagine that these were a full sheet, but we're just going to use two of them to plank half the boat. This is aircraft ply. This is like 1 32nd of an inch. At this scale, it's sort of perfect. Usually when you come up with at scale models, it's hard to get the materials down to an exact reduced scale just because things get, um, it just gets a bit flimsy. So this will be our sides, two one by eights. I've got another couple of one by eights here, which are going to become our bulkheads. I've got a couple of two by fours that are gonna make up the blocking that, uh, that connects the ends of the boat. This will essentially be stems, but they're not gonna look like stems as you, associate them in any other boat. And I've got a whole bunch of one by twos that are gonna make up stringers inside the boat. Say one by threes that are gonna make up some internal structure. And then there's a bunch of smaller stuff that are kind of like one by ones that are gonna be some trim work. Of course, if you go down to the lumber yard, you're gonna, this stuff is probably going to be knotty. That's fine. What we wanna try and do is acquire some materials that don't have any pith in them. And the furthest away from flat sun that they can be is better. So if you can have the, uh, the grain running off at an angle as opposed, or, or perpendicular would be best, which we'll, we'll call vertical grain. If it's dead flat, it's, it's doable. And this process I'm using will allow for using dead flat stuff and it'll still hold together just fine. The prototype is built that way and it's, it's held up perfectly fine. It's about five years old now. So I've been thinking about how I would build this boat again. So let's just start by looking at our drawing here. 
we'll just compare our stock to a, a straight edge on the drawing and it looks like it's perfectly straight enough for our purposes. So what I want to do is I want to draw some lines across it that are going to represent our stations. I've already cut them to length and I'm just going to mark on the edges here where these bulkheads are going to be. Just use a piece of tape here. Keep these from springing apart on me. Uh, this boat is about seven inches overall depth, but we're using one by eight, so it's that seven and a half. And that part of that is um, we've got a little bit of room to straighten up one edge and then a little bit of room to cut our curve off the other edge. And so uh, I felt that was important to have a little bit of wiggle room there. We're, we're going to be gaining some height from the planking. So these bulkheads, I've made them all 18 inches apart instead of 24. And the last couple are a little closer to the ends. Yes about 16 and a half inches from the ends. Now I only need to mark out one side here because the other side is going to get trimmed along with it. So we'll use a sweep to draw in this line. I'm just going to try and find the, the shape that generally matches the one in the drawing. Something like that. So I don't have a pen on me that'll mark that spot and we'll just use a piece of tape here so that'll be my center point bring it over here to where the marks are i didn't mark my ends i did not mark my ends that's important so the one slightly critical dimension i've got here is that i want the ends to be made up out of two by material so over here i thought we would stack them this way it occurs to me, I'll draw it on the other end. I've made these, basically these end blocks are essentially three by three. So you could go either way. We could easily just get away with a single two by four on the ends, but I like the idea of a little extra meat. And one thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna have a little handle that protrudes out from the ends. Um, I've got two different handles, one of them that's sawn to shape out of some two by material and the other one that's built up out of smaller, smaller widths of material. Either way is fine. I kind of like the sawn shape because I think you can get a nicer, nicer shaped handhold. Anyhow, I've got my dimension now. Let's get back to drawing. So the reason for the tape is to mark where the center is and match that on the other side so I get an equally, uh, an even shaped result. Okay, so now I'm just gonna, gonna take this apart. We're going to fold it over. Use a bit of tape to clamp these together. And now we're going to cut these down to shape and I think I'll just whittle them to shape. This is kind of a very similar to a tool that I have my actual workbench. Now if I were doing the real boat, I would actually be grabbing a slick and doing this job with a slick probably. Or I would just get a circular saw or do it on the table saw. But even when I'm model making, I like to think about what will be the actual tools that I use for doing any particular process. And now just to make sure everything is squared up, I'm just gonna do a little jointing operation. So I'm using a, one of my two by fours here to raise my sides up above the tabletop. You lay your plane on the side and it forces the plane to, to shoot square. Of course, sight down your work, just like you're doing the real thing, make sure it looks good. One thing I always do is give myself a, a sur mark at one end. Okay, now I've got my sides here. 
just going to carry those lines up onto the edge. Always useful, even if you don't know for what. And now I need to create the form of the boat. I've made this cross spall here, and I've added it to this little piece of plywood that is going to allow me to put it into a vise. And now I want to make my end pieces. And I'm thinking, as I'm looking at this now, I think the idea of using this stuff stacked up vertically makes a lot more sense to me than it did before. I want to thank all my subscribers for their ongoing support, their comments, their shares, and good wishes. And I also want to thank all of my followers on Patreon whose monthly pledges support this channel. If you can help us on Patreon, I would really appreciate it. There are links in the corner or down in the description. And what I want to do is I want to stack these like so. And then I want to put my bevel on the end. Okay, so if I do two more of those, I'm good. Now this occur what occurs to me now as I'm working on this is that I will be needing another 2x4 for doing the ends. Luckily I have one on hand, but for future reference. Now we want to pull a bevel off of one of these. Okay, now we're going to draw that angle onto all of these sides. So for model making, I find it's advantageous to have a bit of sandpaper on a board just to clean up surfaces that are otherwise fiddly to try and plane. When I cut these, I decided to go with the vertical orientation. It just seemed to make sense. And now I'm just debating whether or not I should worry about taking the bevel off of here. That seems like it might not be a terrible idea. Probably going to be easier for me to cut this bevel on a bench or in a vise than it will be to try and cut it on the model. So I'm going to pick up an angle there. Something like that. Okay, so we've got our two sides, and they're going to go like that. We've got our two ends. One's going to go that way. One's going to go that way. I want to add my center lines to the other sides of these while I have the chance. I'm going to go all the way around because it's just smart to do that. Okay, so... What I'm thinking is this. I actually, I want this to sit not dead on the bottom because there's a step that I want to do for my two by four shorts. I will save your shorts. Okay, you stay there. You and you go there, and you are going to make it? Yes, just, just, let's back off on that a little. I just want to center up this cross ball on our center marks generally. There we go. Okay, now in theory, we should be able to bring these ends together like so, those ends together like so. It looks like it's going to work out pretty good. Okay, so what I think I'll do 
This will try just gluing one end at a time. So put some star bond thick on the end of this guy. Give that a spritz. You know what? I just wonder if I should have a bit of tape underneath here to keep it from sticking to my bench. Or if that will make any difference. That seems pretty good. I'm going to do the other end as well. This video is actually somewhat sponsored by Starbond. They've given me a bunch of this product to play around with. And you can follow a link in the description to Starbond's website. You can use the coupon code NOMAD10 and that will get you 10% discount on any Starbond products and it gets me a little bit of kickback. I don't shill for anybody whose products I don't like. And so this Starbond, I have specifically come to really enjoy. What I like about it is when you use the accelerator, it doesn't make the glue too hot. I think most cyanoacrylates are almost the same, but I find this particular one doesn't, doesn't smoke up on you the way others do. That's especially useful if you're trying to use cyanoacrylates to fix little uh, voids in a finish, so you get a dent in your varnish or something like that. You can fill that dent with cyanoacrylate and it will level out and you can sand it flush and make that dent disappear. But the danger with doing that is that when you hit it with the accelerator, it tends to, some of them tend to sort of kind of cure really quickly and they'll smoke a little bit and you'll get this cloudy white finish and I find the star bond is really good at not doing that. That's not the only thing I like. So here's a package of star bond and check this out. The silly of the bottle with a cap on it but then they give you two tips because I never get through a bottle of this stuff without it the tips clogging up on me but then they also provide a whole bunch of micro applicators here for sneaking your adhesive into tiny, tiny little spots. And then this little pricker, which you can use as a cap as well. So this has got a little pin inside of it. So if you want to, you can use this as a cap to keep your, your cyanoacrylate cap from gumming up. But for the most part, it's intended to just clear a blocked cap. So I think that's particularly uh, fantastic that they provide those little things. And I've got some, some thick gap filling, which is what I use most of the time I find. I've got some thin, and this is water thin, so this gets perfect for sneaking into tiny, tiny little cracks. And then this one's black, so if you're doing some work with ebony or something like that, you can have a, a black glue line or you can fill gaps in ebony. Okay, last corner. There we go. There's our basic form. The edges of these planks themselves in real life are thick enough for nailing the edge of our plywood on here, but I want to put my handrails on and so I want some extra thickness for that and that's what these are for. Now in the original I put a nailer all the way along, I don't think that was necessary. So I think this is all I need. Now I could absolutely be doing this without using the accelerator, I'm sure, but I'm using it anyway. It just speeds things up a little bit. Okay, now the toughest part is actually going to be figuring out these bulkheads. Well, it's not really tough, but it's going to take me a moment to 
think on the best way to go about it. Okay, so I've got two different woods here I need. I need the inside the shear, and then I also need inside this blocking. So that's my width. I need a height for my notches. Okay, I like that. Now I need an overall height. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to have stringers running above and below these bulkheads because these. I think a lot of the weight in the boat came from these bulkheads. They were pretty heavy. And the boat suffers from not having this extra support on the plywood. So what I want to do is just have bulkheads supporting stringers both sides. And I don't need the bulkheads to come up to the surface, I don't think. I think they're going to be fine if they were lower. And that actually probably makes for quite a savings in a finished boat. Two, four... Yeah, five and a half. You could get away with one by sixes for these instead of one by eights. Ooh, now I tell you, this is exactly when I wish I just had a tiny, tiny little table saw. I do not have one. But what I do have are marking gauges. And so I will use marking gauges on stuff like this. So if I set that guy there. Hit it from both sides. So fiddly working on this little tiny stuff, I tell you. good. And now I just have some little notches to make. Tell you what, I'm using the wrong glasses. I need my zoom lenses. Oh, that's much better. So the center one is a bit like a template. Okay, that looks good. Oh, I probably overshot. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. All right, back to the drawing. All right, so a couple of things I want to do. One of them is I need a center line on here. So I'll do that. And I want to take one of my stringers and I just want to make sure I give myself a little bit of an offset to follow for when I attach them. Okay, and we need that to go right across to the bottom as well. So we'll do both of those like so. And now I was thinking, what I was thinking was that this, these guys would be spread out, dividing up the space. Something like that. I want them far enough outboard that it makes a good runner on the bottom, but close enough inboard that it provides support when you're walking on it. So I think if we go about there, that looks pretty good. I'm gonna mark that right on the drawing. This is doing two things. It's giving me something to follow, but it's also giving me something, some place I can make notes. Okay, for instance, like, Where's my, and this is, just draw a line in there. We'll do a rough finished refined drawing, but there's our in whale or clamp, as you might call it. 
And I can make a note here that one by six, just take that out. Like the idea of the vertical two bys down here. And you could probably get away with one, but I like the idea of doubling that up because we're going to be adding this handle on here and I want lots of meat into the, in that area. So there's a stringer right there. And we'll flip this over, annotate the other side. And I'm going to do the same thing down here. I'm going to do both sides because it's just going to be a way I can mark the other bulkheads for where to put those stringers quickly. The next bulkhead I'm going to mark right there. So that's going to be our width. So in theory, that should be our height. And I need two out of here, so I might as well just split this whole piece down. There's one. There's two. Let's clean up that split edge. Okay. This little rig I have here does not at all like to work for me on this bench. It's like got the opposite, the opposite resistance to what I need. I did think about the idea of just like notching these things in. And I think on our prototype, we'd, we'd put one stringer up the middle and we notched it in. But in retrospect, I think it is probably easier to just run these stringers on top and bottom and screw them into the, screw them or nail them to the bulkheads. Three done, four more to go. I'll use up some of my shorts here. Mark the other dimensions while you have a chance. Now the height. That works. No, nope, that doesn't work. Oh well, no harm in trying. You know what always works for me is making a little stop. Spritz, build the workbench that you need. That's the rule. So much better. If only this would stay put. <laughs> what I need is like a model making, a dedicated model making workbench. Now I have thought about that. Now, in the real world, we would be cutting bevels on the ends of these too, but we're not going to do that here in this little model making world because that is too much trouble. Let's see, we got our widest one, which is going to go where that cross ball is. But I think before I add that, I want to just add the other ones. Yeah. Just add some glue where they got to go. And I'll just slide them into place. good. Oh, I wanted to add holes for lightening it up, but I'm just thinking maybe that's just too much trouble. Yeah, I'm thinking it's more trouble than it's worth. There wouldn't be very large holes. And lastly, Thank you. 
So far, so good.